Okay, so today uh, we will continue the last piece of uh, propositional logic, uh, and then we will move on to the second part of this course, which is about answer set programming, ASP, uh, that you use as a keyword uh, standing for this um, uh, programming method. Okay, so uh, we talk about uh, three concepts. So first we define actually, before that, uh, we define uh, valuation and interpretation, okay? Uh, after that, uh, we define some notions uh, that are derived from the uh, uh, valuation. So we talk about uh, tautology, where the formula uh, the tautology is a formula that is true for all uh, valuation. And, and uh, satisfiability means that the formula is true for some uh, valuation, okay? Now, one question to uh, think about is how are these two concepts uh, related to each other? Okay, so how are tautology and uh, satisfiability are related to each other? So this is a sentence um, saying that if you have a set of formulas f1 through fn, and you see that this is unsatisfiable, okay? This is actually equivalent to saying that negation of f1 uh, through fn, the conjunction of all these formulas, is a tautology. So on the one side, we talk about uh, unsatisfiability, which is actually the opposite of satisfiability, okay? And on the other side, we have a tautology, okay? So unsatisfiable uh, means is a negation of satisfiability, meaning that there is no interpretation that satisfies all formulas. So for all interpretation, there is at least one formula that becomes false. So you cannot make all formulas to be true, okay? That's what the left-hand side is saying. By the way, this if, uh, if IFF means if and only if is a two-way uh, uh, implications, okay? So when you say the set is unsatisfiable, meaning that uh, for all interpretation, for every interpretation, there is at least one formula that becomes false. Okay, it's same as when you put the whole formulas as a conjunction and put the negation, then this becomes always true. Okay, so if you're keen to the definition, you can figure it out why this uh, makes sense. Uh, but before we do that, let's actually look at some example. So let me write this formula. So I wrote three formulas, P, Q, and not P or not Q. Is it satisfiable or not? Can you find an interpretation that satisfies all formulas? No, it's not possible because you have to, at least uh, you have to satisfy P, that means P should be true and Q should be true, okay? But if you have that interpretation, you cannot satisfy the third formula, not P or not Q cannot be satisfied. So this is unsatisfiable. This is an example of unsatisfiable set. Now what that means is if you put the negation and make a whole uh, set as a conjunction of formulas, then this is a tautology. So this is unsatisfiable, and this is a tautology. So this is an example. If you have an unsatisfiable set, then you can form a tautology using the sets in that formula. And vice versa, if you have some formula of this form that starts with negation, followed by the conjunction of these formulas. Now if you know that this formula is a tautology, that means each of these components, P, Q, and not P or not Q, is unsatisfiable. Okay? And you can actually prove this. Uh, I'm not going to show the proof, uh, but let me just illustrate uh, this idea using the example, like here, okay? So when you prove if and only if statement, uh, as you learn in natural deduction, you have to prove two things. One is assume the left-hand side and try to derive the right-hand side, and also vice versa. So let's try to uh, see why it makes sense. When you assume, Let's say this is unsatisfiable. So let's actually, we know that uh, this set is unsatisfiable. Meaning that there is at least one of them must be false for any interpretation that you apply. Meaning that if you negate 
that conjunction, that negation becomes true for any interpretation. Hence the proof. Okay? So I just use the definition. Uncertainty is probability means that there is at least one inter uh, I'm sorry. There is for any form uh, interpretation, there is at least one formula that is uh, not satisfied. That means if you have all conjunction, this conjunction is always false. Which means that if you negate that conjunction, it becomes true for any interpretation. So that formula must be a tautology. And the other way is actually uh, the same. So if this is a tautology, then not all of these conjunctive terms become true. So at least one of them is false, meaning that this is unsatisfiable. Okay? All right. So that's what you get. Okay, the proof is just to make this uh, notation more formal, uh, but the idea is actually the same. Yes? Uh, what do you like, exactly mean when you say interpretation? Interpretation is a function that maps signature to choose values. We learned that right after the function. Okay, so if you have PQR, okay, so that's the atoms. So the function that assigns truth values to this PQR, this is an interpretation. So, okay. so, uh, so uh, uh, the three or four atoms can have like any variable number of interpretations. Two to the power n. So if you are unsure about that, go back to the uh, slide that we talked before. All right. So the next thing is. Obvious, uh, so once you know this, of course, you can make a variation. So here, this is unsatisfiable if and only if this. It's actually the same statement uh, that you can uh, write here. If you uh, flip this value, okay? So this set is unsatisfiable, meaning that the negation of this means it's actually satisfiable. And negation of this one is actually this is not a tautology. So these two statements are actually the same statement. I just uh, write in a different form, but they actually mean the same thing. OK, question about this? So one thing that you can apply here is suppose you know that p if and only q. This is actually the same as saying that p is equivalent to not q, right? So these two uh, formulas are equivalent. If you, are, if you apply the definition of equivalence, if you know that P is equivalent to Q, you can also find out that not P is equivalent to not Q. Okay? So in that sense, what I do here is this is my P, this is my Q. So I wrote in the first sentence P if and only if Q. In the second sentence, I wrote not P roughly speaking, is equivalent to non-Q. So these two statements actually convey the same meaning. Okay? All right. The next one is how the internment and tautology are related. And somebody actually asked the question, and I also posted uh, the response on the Piazza. So this is an answer. So uh, when you say internment, it means if you apply any, if you find any interpretation that satisfies these formulas, the interpretation must satisfy this formula as well. Meaning that if this is true, then this must be true for all interpretations. Okay? So if you don't know exactly what internment means, you can actually rely on this proposition to understand the internment in terms of the tautology. You just make the whole formulas in the uh, premises as a conjunction. And if that implies the conclusion, okay, if that implication itself is a tautology, okay, then you can say the internment is true. Okay? Slightly different way to say the same thing is how do you know that uh, G is not entailed from F1 to F10? How do you know that this is not entailed? You can say that this is not, uh, the right hand side is not a tautology. Meaning that there is one interpretation that satisfies F1 through Fn, but does not satisfy G. Okay? So let's look at an uh, example. Um, so let's say uh, F, we have P or Q, and not P or Q. 
Does it entail P? And Q is? Okay, so let's say P is false and Q is true. What happens to the formulas on the left hand side? This is true, right? Because Q is true, so Q or whatever it is true. Okay, same for the next one, right? So when you apply this interpretation, by the way, this is an example of interpretation P is false, Q is true. Okay, so if you apply this interpretation, these two formulas are true under this interpretation. But if you uh, look at the right hand side, this P is actually false under this interpretation. Okay? So the internal does not hold. <coughs> Meaning that P or Q, and not P or Q, implies P is not a tautology. And if you look at the thing, if it is not a tautology, it means that there is one interpretation that falsifies this formula, right? And what is that interpretation? Q is false, P is accurate. Yeah, actually, the same thing we can apply, right? We need only one the, uh, interpretation that makes this formula to be false, so let's just use the same interpretation. Okay? So, vice versa. If you know that the right hand side formula is a tautology, then the internal also holds. Or if your right hand side is not a tautology, then the internal does not hold. Okay? A uh, very special case is when the premise is empty. So uh, G is entailed from empty set of formula, meaning that G is a tautology. Okay? So some of the examples that you did in homework one. Okay, so you, we didn't have all the uh, premises there, right? Many of them didn't have premises. And you can actually go back to these formulas and check each of these formulas of tautology. Okay, you can draw the truth table and find out that those formulas that you proved in natural deduction are tautologies. If the formula were derived from the empty set of premises. Okay? Uh, question up to this part. Okay. The next one is entailment and satisfiability. Okay. Well, actually, you already learned two things. Okay, and from this you can compose the third thing. Okay. So what we are doing is you learned what is tautology and satisfiability were related, and in the next slide. You we just talk about uh, entailment and tautology. Now we are trying to talk about this, which can be actually composed from the two known relationship. Okay, so if you do that, what you get is this: uh, f one through f n entails g if and only if this set is unsatisfiable. So let's look at an example. Actually, we can use the same example. Um, actually, let's look at this one. Um, is this internal true? P or Q and not P or Q, does it entail Q? Yes. How do we check the internment? You bring all interpretations, there are four interpretations, okay, and for each interpretation, check whether this form, uh, interpretation satisfies these formulas, then you also check whether the Q is true. Okay? So, if you do that, um, you will see that actually this is true. Okay, this internment holds for whatever interpretation that satisfies these two formulas must also satisfy Q. Okay? 
according to this uh, uh, relationship that I just said, this is unsatisfiable. Okay. Which means, if you know that this one is true, right? This internment is actually true. You can find that this set is unsatisfiable. Why? Well, because any interpretation that satisfies these two must satisfy this one. But if you put the negation, the, the uh, interpretation cannot satisfy the negation. Do you get it? Let me repeat. So by the definition of internment, if you ha have all every interpretation that satisfies these two guys, must satisfy this guy as well. OK? Now, if you happen to choose the interpretation that satisfies both two, then internment means that Q should be true, but now you have a set uh, in the set uh, not Q. So the interpretation cannot satisfy the third guy. It's unsatisfiable. OK? And vice versa, you can actually prove this um, um, same thing uh, using the definitions. Okay. Any question up to this part? All right. Okay. So the next uh, we talk about soundness and completeness uh, theorem. So let let's actually review this uh, thing. So soundness means that basically, uh, let me actually tell you about the history. So. Uh, there are actually two ways to understand propositional logic. One is using only natural deduction. Uh, another is using only the satisfaction and internment and so on and so forth. Okay? So the first thing that we did was only using natural deduction. That was called proof theory. Okay? So it's only about the proof, how to write uh, the proof for the sequence. The next, we wrote uh, uh, interpretation, variation, satisfaction, pathology, Internment, uh, satisfiability. So those things uh, belong to so-called model theory. Okay. So these are just two ways to define propositional logic. And what uh, soundness and completeness theorem is saying is these two notions are actually uh, coinc uh, these two notions coincide. So when you, you you can understand in both ways, it does not actually matter. Okay. So soundness theorem means suppose you only know about the natural deduction. Okay, so you can prove the sequence. Okay, so gamma is a set of premises, and you derive f from the gamma, and you're using the natural deduction rules that you did in the first of this uh, uh, first part of the semester. Um, if you the sequence can be proved, okay, that's what pro the proof theory is about. Okay, the soundness theorem is saying that if you can prove the natural deduction in natural deduction, then uh, gamma entails f in the sense of model theory. So soundness theory is saying proof from the proof theory of propositional logic, you can go into the model theory of uh, propositional logic. Okay. So if you can derive using these uh, uh, deduction rules or like calculus that you studied, if you can do that, then you can also draw the truth table and check whether the interpretation that satisfies all the formulas in the gamma also satisfies that. Okay. So that's what uh, soundness theorem is about. If you can prove by natural deduction, you can also draw the truth table and check whether this internment holds. Okay. The completeness theorem is opposite. The completeness theorem is if you can do everything in terms of the truth table by writing a big truth table to check the internment, okay, which is probably a lot of former uh, pro uh, problems uh, that you're going to do this week is about uh, drawing the truth table. If you can do that, there's also a way to prove that in natural deduction. Okay. So here I uh, denote uh, some informal uh, description about this theorem. So sound this uh, means that any formula that you derive from natural deduction is actually meaningful. It is actually sound. Okay. It actually conveys the uh, real truth. Complete this theorem is also anything that makes sense as a truth can be derived from the calculus of natural deduction. Now, of course, uh, this is an example that we talk about. Uh, you can prove these things. Um, uh, the natural deduction, we already did that in the, I think that was the uh, uh, Litton problem, right? Litton or Keith? 
the uh, kids. Uh, so the last uh, problem of the kids what was about uh, deriving uh, this uh, using a sort option. But we also did it in class that the internment is actually true. Okay? Inter uh, how many interpretations satisfy formulas on the left hand side? Do you remember? There's only one. And that interpretation happened to satisfy T as well. Okay? So you can uh, argue in terms of truth, uh, truth table. Okay, this is what you do with truth table. And this is what you do with natural deduction. If you can do in one way, you can do in the other way too. Now why does it actually matter? Uh, here's actually a question that uh, we want to consider. Okay, so I give you this sequence, uh, which is not P or Q implies P, derives in P and Q. Uh, I'm asking you to um, check whether this is provable in natural deduction, and if so, show the proof. Anyone can do this? If you can show this convincing proof, I will give A, uh, a plus immediately. So show the proof. I can just uh, stop here and I can wait until the end of the class. There's somebody is doing. I can enjoy my drink. <laughs> come to the board too. We can have multiple solutions. Yeah. I said show the proof. Oh, show the proof. Yeah. Can't show the proof. Okay, then you don't get any. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, uh, uh, so, yes, uh, he's actually right. There is actually no proof. Okay. Um, why is not provable? Um, but how do we know that this is not provable? That's actually a more interesting question, right? Do you have a proof? I was just saying, you can show it's not Yeah, uh, yeah. well, what do you mean by too stable here? Where is too stable? Yeah, so you start to use uh, the theorem, okay? So that's good. Okay, so exactly the reason that I'm bringing up here, the question is uh, uh, for that. So let me actually go uh, from the beginning. So I ask you to determine uh, whether there is a proof. And in fact, there is actually no proof, so you cannot show the proof. But how do you know that uh, there is no proof? So if you didn't learn internal, if you didn't learn completeness or soundness theorem, okay, all you can do is try to derive, the proof, uh, derive this uh, formula from the natural deduction. So remember, when you did homework one, what did you do? You have to, you, have, you use these uh, deduction rules in very complicated way. Sometimes it didn't actually work, but you have to try this and that, and until you find some answer, right? But however, if there was no answer from the beginning, if there is no proof from the beginning, how can that method be working? You will waste a lot of time, right? No matter what you do, there is actually no proof. So you need to think in different ways, much different from what you were uh, doing before. And that's where the soundness and complete theorem is actually coming in. And for those who get the sense, can you tell me which theorem is actually used to say that this is not possible? Is it soundness one or the complete one? Anyone? Somebody says, this is 
Samnes? Are you sure about that? <laughs> okay, so uh, there's too much jumping, so let's actually go uh, one by one. Okay, so um, let's try to see how to use these theorems. Okay, so when I said uh, derive f from the gamma using natural deduction, so that's uh, proof, right? So the method that we used was to show a derivation from f using the rules uh, from gamma using the rules of natural deduction, and that's by definition. By definition, proof means that you have you, you show the sequence of derivation in natural deduction. That's a by definition. But now, what you can do is this: instead of showing the probability there, you can use this meta level of the proof, which means that um, use the theorem. Here, actually, the complete theorem. The complete theorem is saying that if you can have, uh, if you happen to prove that gamma entails f then there is always a deduction of f from gamma. So now your test is reduced to, uh, uh, the test reduced to prove the integral. Okay. So what that means is the, the given problem was this. You have to show this. But if you happen to show this one, if suppose it was actually easier to prove the integral than the uh, 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 proof, uh, proof in natural deduction, then this is actually a good way. So you show the interment holds, okay? And then the complete theorem is saying, if the interment is true, then probability is true. So combine these two ideas. So you, this is actually kind of modus ponens too. If you happen to, so this is complete theorem is saying, if gamma entails f, you can say that gamma uh, derives f in natural deduction. So all you need to do is to supply the antecedent. So if you show this is actually true, then using this one and this one, you can derive the consequent. That's modus ponens or implication and elimination rule in natural deduction, right? And I'm actually using natural deduction in two different levels. So let me not confuse you. So one thing is you show that gamma entails f, then by the complete theorem, you can say that gamma derives f. Um, is it not possible to use natural deduction to like show whether or not something is provable? If it is provable, yes, you can show. But if it's not provable, how can you show? Like without, without using a talent, can you prove that something how is? Can you do? How can know. you do it? How can you do it? That's my question. <laughs> okay, maybe there is another level of meta-level theorem that we can use, but this is what uh, people do. Yeah, are, are we clear here? So, in order to prove that something is derivable, you can do two things. You can just show the proof directly, or you can use the, uh, you can check the, uh, you can prove the interment, and then using the complete theorem, derive the probability. Okay, good. Now, the next the question is about what, uh, what you are saying. How do we show that this is not provable? F uh, uh, is uh, how uh, gamma derives f is not provable. Okay. So the hint is actually the Sandy theorem is helping here. The Sandy theorem is saying that if sequence is provable in natural induction, then gamma entails f. Okay. There is a slight problem here. Slight problem. Our test is to show that this is not provable. On the other hand, some theorem itself does not mention about it. It actually talks about provability, but not the improvability. So how can we do that? Take the contrapositive. <laughs> 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 so here, yes. <laughs> right. So what is the contrapositive? Contrapositive means, uh, so let's say we have statement like P implies Q. This is conditional statement, right? If P, then Q. Okay, uh, let me actually write in English. If P, then Q, this is called conditional statement. Contrapositive means if not Q, then not P. And these two statements are actually equivalent. P implies Q is equal to not Q implies not P. So instead of using the first form, we can use the second form. So that's called, uh, that's a contrapositive of uh, uh, some theorem, meaning that if gamma, 
that's not Intel left. Then so I use two not both in the antecedent and the consequence. If you can somehow check that gamma does not entail F, then you can say that there is no proof in natural deduction. Okay? So let's uh, go back to this problem. So I was asking about I asked uh, this question, right? Is it provable or not? Um, in fact, there is actually strong evidence that this is not provable if you try to prove this uh, million of uh, days before you still cannot find it, and then you start to think maybe we have to approach it before this. So how do we this, uh, prove that this is not provable? Now let's use the contrapositive of the sound theorem. If you can somehow show that um, this formula does not entail this. Okay? Then you can say not P. Okay. It's not provable. Right? That's what uh, the contrapositive of the sound is saying. Okay? So you have to derive this thing, okay? You want to prove, uh, you want to say that there is no proof of uh, this net, uh, deduction. Then now the goal is to prove this. Once you prove this, we can derive this, right? So how do you prove this? This is actually much easier, right? How do you, uh, how do you know that this determinant does not hold? For the determinant not to hold, how many interpretations do we need? That's one. Yes. So what is that interpretation? P is true, Q is true. Okay, so let's uh, use that. So suppose P is true, Q is true. Uh, what happens to the uh, this formula, what is the uh, evalu evaluation of this formula under the inter interpretation that P is true, Q is true? It's true, why? Because um, Q implies P is actually true, true implies true is true, so true or anything is actually true, so this becomes true. What about this? This is false because P is true, so now P is false, false and true is false. So left hand side is true, right hand side is false, so it does not hold. Since we know that internal does not hold by the uh, contrapositive of Sharnley's theorem, we say that uh, the sequence is not provable. Done. Okay? Right. So, okay. So, in other words, these two uh, statements are the same thing, right? So, Soundness and uh, complete theorem is saying this can be derived if and only if this. But uh, this is also same as saying that if it's not derivable, then uh, internal also does not hold and vice versa. So sometimes you need, you want to use the positive version of this theorem. Sometimes you want to use the negative ver uh, version of this theorem. Okay, it depends on how you uh, do. It. Okay, are we clear about it? Okay, All right. All right, so the next thing is about uh, CNF and DNF. So CNF stands for conjunctive normal form, and DNF stands for disjunctive normal form. So in the theoretical computer science, uh, there's something called normal form, uh, where the syntactic uh, 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 object is, could be very complex, but uh, they somehow reduce to very simple form. Okay, so any complex proposition formula can be turned into a uh, 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 CNF form or the DNF form. Okay, so that's uh, what um, uh, we will do. So first, what is actually the conjunctive normal form? 
And this is a bit tricky, so we are going to do some uh, quiz. So let's uh, uh, look at the definition carefully. Okay. So um, first, uh, the definition. We know what is an atom, right? So atom is P Q R. What is a literal? Literal is either an atom or is negation. Okay. And then we talk about a simple disjunction. A simple disjunction is just a disjunction <coughs> over these literals. Okay. Now, what is a conjunctive normal form? Conjunctive normal form is this form. It's called conjunctive normal form because it is a conjunction of many formulas, f1 through fn. But now, if you look at each of these formula fi, they are simple disjunction. Okay. So it's basically conjunction over disjunction of literals. That's what conjunctive normal form is about. Okay, are we ready to do this challenge? Okay. So I'm going to give you, let's say, true false. Let's do that. It's always fun to do. So, Let's look at this. Okay. So this, is this formula conjunctive normal form? So this is again that you have to use the pattern match. Okay. So find out where is the F1, Fm, okay, and what is actually L1 and Ln in each of this uh, conjunctive term. Okay. Okay, so let's check that. Okay, so some people are still doing. All right, so uh, two thirds were saying true, one third is uh, false. Uh, the answer is actually true. Okay, so let's see why. So this is an, again a pattern match. This part you can read as F1. This is F2. This is F3. So there are three uh, dis uh, simple disjunction here. Okay. So F1 is a simple disjunction because that's a disjunction over literals. Okay. Each of them is not Q, P, R. They are literals. Same for the F2. Not P is a literal. R is a literal. Disjunction over them. Over them is a uh, uh, simple disjunction. Now Q is a bit tricky, uh, but if you look at the index carefully, you don't actually need a disjunction. If you have only one, uh, that's also called simple disjunction. By definition, if you look at the second bullet, a simple disjunction has this form. When n equals one, there is no disjunction. There's only one literal L1. And that's what the third case is about. Can we think of this either product of sums or sum of products? Something like that, yes. But don't go into that yet because it you may get confused soon. Okay? But if we talk about only F1 or only F2, then those are uh, C and F by themselves too. Only F1? Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Okay? So, the next one, okay, let me actually erase uh, these. Okay, so second formula, look at the second formula. Okay, and let me finish off this, and true false again, let's start. So second formula, is this CNF or not? Okay, are we done? Okay, it is false. Yes, it is false. Why? Because 
if you try to uh, match this one must the first one uh, this one must be of simple disjunction meaning that disjunction over uh, uh, either atom or negation but this one has negation over more complex formulas so this is not CNF now if you take this one uh, this is actually related to the question that was raised earlier if you take this one is this CNF or not It is also CNF, and in this case, M here equals 1. There's no conjunction, but it is still called conjunctive normal form because uh, this case, M equals 1, uh, uh, happens to be this. Okay, so when M equals 1, uh, it's only F1, which is a simple disjunction, and this is simple disjunction. Okay? Good. Is this the NF? Is this? Uh, disjunctive normal form is defined in an opposite uh, manner. So just turn uh, the conjunction into disjunction and disjunction into conjunction, then you get disjunctive normal form. Meaning that uh, when you say simple conjunction, this is a conjunction of a simple uh, uh, things, which is a literal. Now disjunctive normal form has the uh, disjunction over simple conjunction. Okay? So um, is this in, uh, DNF? In this case, uh, what is M and what is N? Okay, let's say, what is M here? M is 3, yes? So here, each of them counts for uh, these formulas. So this is F1, F2, F3. Now each Fi happens to be also a simple conjunction where N equals 1. Okay, so this is uh, DNF. What about this? Is this DNF? What is M in this case? M equals 1. What is N in that first FI, F1? 2, correct. Good. So, I mean, this is just a definition that uh, you can uh, try. So. Uh, obviously, the quiz that I, I can give you is uh, true or false, okay? So um, is this DNF or CNF? And I said uh, typically that the students understand halfway can get more than 50%. So okay, try to understand uh, in a complete uh, manner, okay? All right, so what is the uh, theorem on uh, CNF and DNF? So basically, every, uh, any, um, any proposition formula can be converted into CNF or DNF. Uh, there's some condition that we have to say. Um, so the signature should be non-empty. I will talk about, maybe if you have time, we'll talk about why this condition is needed. But basically, the theorem is saying any formula can be turned into CNF or DNF in an equivalent way. So let's actually play with that. So we know that uh, uh, this top is not a CNF. It's also not a DNF. Okay. Can we turn this into CNF or DNF? Yes. Hmm? Uh, so, what can be that formula? So let's try to turn it into CNF first. What is the formula to do that? Okay, so first, you think that this is a CNF. Uh, there are actually multiple kinds to check. 
First, uh, we have to check whether this is CNF, and also we have to check whether this formula is equivalent to tau. Right? Actually, the second is easier to check, right? So P or not P is always true, no matter what uh, maybe that you assign to P. So, and uh, tau is always true, okay, by definition. That's good. So these two formulas are equivalent. Now we have to check whether, whether P or not P is CNF. So what is M in that case? So M here is F1 conjunction with uh, F2, Fm. Uh, this whole thing is uh, one conjunctive term. There is actually no conjunction symbol here, uh, but this is uh, one conjunctive term there. So M equals one in this case, yes. And in that case, we have to also look into uh, this formula where P or P is a simple disjunction, and it is the case. So this is CNF. Good. Now, are we together? Probably not. <laughs> okay, some of you may have lost somewhere. Okay, so uh, after this lecture, maybe you want to come back to the definition. Okay? Yep. So we say <coughs> M equals 1 because, like in our formula for CNF, mm -hmm. P or not P is equivalent to like your F1. Yes. When m equals 1, so let's actually go back. So when m equals 1 here, this is actually the same as just of f1. And just f1 should be a simple disjunction. So p or not p is a simple disjunction that is in f1 here. OK, good. All right, uh, now we have to find dnf. What is the uh, DNF form of this tau? So you can use actually the same formula. In this case, what is M? M is 2. So this is actually the same formula, but it is a disjunction over two formulas. And each disjunctive term is also a simple conjunction. Okay. So depending on how you view this, uh, the same formula can be viewed as CNF or it can be uh, DNF. Good. Uh, similar thing happens here. So bottom. You can do P and not P. This can never be true, right? Is this CNF? Well, if it is CNF, what is the M here? What is M here? Two. It can be also DNF. Okay, what is M here? One, correct. Good. So you guys know that. Uh, you can actually uh, convert more complex formula like this into CNF and DNF. Okay, uh, and the equivalent transformation that uh, I gave you as a homework problem uh, can be useful here. So let's actually try to do that. So when you have this, obviously this is not CNF or DNF, right? One thing that you can do is to use the Morgan's law. And if you do that, um, okay, you will get not P, and conjunction inside turns into, I mean, disjunction inside turns uh, into conjunction, and not Q and R. We can do one more time. We can do not Q or not R. Okay. Now at this point, um, I can actually stop and claim that this is one of the CNF or DNF. Is it CNF or DNF? The last formula that I wrote is this CNF or DNF? This is CNF. It's a conjunction over simple disjunction, so that's CNF. But is is it DNF? It's not. Okay. So in order to turn into DNF. I can further distribute conjunction over disjunction. Another uh, homework problem that you have to prove. Okay, so you, when you do that, you will get this one. This is pretty much like algebra when you have uh, a multiplication distribute over uh, addition. Okay, and now after you do this, the last formula is the yeah. is a disjunction over simple conjunctions. Okay. So this is CNF, and this is DNF. OK? All right. OK. 
Okay. So now our textbook actually has a general procedure to convert into CNF, uh, but uh, maybe I will skip this for now, and I'll move on to the next uh, subject. Okay. All right. Uh, when you go to a class like 340, you will learn a uh, recursive decent parser, and uh, basically the idea is the uh, same as there. So I can skip this uh, for now. All right, so uh, we are done with the uh, propositional logic. And as I promised, the next is uh, to use this as a programming language. And in particular, uh, we will tweak the propositional logic a bit. Uh, so that uh, will take us a few classes, and then we'll get into the actual programming. So the idea is this. Um, when you're trying to solve problems um, using computer, what do we do? Um, so we first need to understand what is the problem, and then you convert into the form that computers can understand, and the computer generates output, and from this you interpret uh, the solutions uh, coming out of this output. Okay. That's how you do. Now, in terms of the uh, typical uh, programming or, uh, or procedural programming that we do, um, how do we under, uh, make the computers understand uh, the problem? You have to do programming. Okay, so programming is a conversion from problem to uh, some program. And then you execute the program, and that will generate some output. And you interpret the output, that becomes the solution to the problem. Now, uh, in the declarative programming that we are going to study now, it's slightly different. Uh, when you convert, when you try to solve problem, you are going to model the problem into certain representation, but you don't necessarily give algorithm. Okay? And you just ask computer to solve based on the specification, and then uh, the computer returns the output, and you get the solution. Okay. So one of the uh, method in the declarative programming is uh, called answer set programming, and this is actually very uh, rich has a very rich history and a lot of uh, things done. Uh, but for this class, we will just uh, look at some uh, initial uh, uh, basic of this uh, programming method. Okay. So uh, we are going to use it uh, for some uh, computer science uh, uh, related subject that we are going to learn. So this is a declarative programming paradigm. Declarative here means that uh, you don't necessarily tell the computer what to do um, or how to do, how to solve this problem. You don't do that, but you just describe what is the problem. Okay? You represent the problem, and the rest of this thing uh, should be done by the, uh, pro uh, uh, the programming platform uh, automatically. Okay? So uh, its theoretical basis is called answer set uh, semantics, or also known as stable model semantics, which is slightly uh, tweaked from the uh, propositional logic. Okay, so we are going to learn that. Uh, it has very uh, rich uh, language construct, uh, default uh, recursive definitions, aggregates, and preference, uh, which we are going to learn uh, later. So. Uh, for now, the programming that we are going to do here is you start with the problem, and then you, the modeling here is to write an answer set programs. So you are going to write uh, some answer set program, and the execution here means solving uh, this program using uh, some special engine called ASP Solver, answer set programming solver. Okay. So the basic idea of this programming is you represent the problem by a set of rules. And then find answer sets uh, using ASP solver, and then extract solutions uh, from this. So this is uh, NPIN's uh, puzzle. So maybe uh, let's actually illustrate the idea here. So this is a typical uh, problem, benchmark problem in AI. So you have some n by n uh, chessboard. Okay, let, me, okay, let me write the other color. Okay. So let's say we have three by three chessboard, and we have to play three pins uh, in this grid, but no two pins can be on the same row or color or diagonal. Okay, how many solutions are there? Hmm? 
How many solutions are there? I mean, if, <laughs> if like a tic tac toe, right? You have to place three pins, but no two pins should attack each other. Attacking here means the same row or column or same diagonal, right? How many solutions are there? There's no solution. Okay, good. What about the four by four? How many solutions will be there? Well, let's do this. Um, so let's say one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay. So give me the uh, row number first, and then color. One, one. Okay. Two, two? No, two, two cannot be. Because two, if you put two, two, then it attacks. No, so three, two. Three, two. Three, two here. Okay. Two, four. Two, four. Okay. Huh? Four, four, no? No? That doesn't work. You have to place four pins now because it's four by four pins. Where do you put the four? Huh? So no, no solution? I haven't you played this game before? If you're doing AI, you will play this kind of game a lot. Okay? How many solutions do we need? It's just four by four, right? Zero. zero. Actually, zero is not the correct solution. It happens to be this way um, that I know immediately somebody says uh, some position. I know that there cannot be a solution because of the bad choice. But if we avoided uh, uh, that choice, we could have gotten a solution. So let's actually try different one. Somebody says two. Okay. Anyone say? that what is the position to fill? One, two, one, three. Okay. And? Two. Let's look at the row two. Where to put? Two, one. Okay. In four, two? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay, so that's one solution. Another solution is to take this 90 degree bump. Okay, so that's another solution. Good. Um, so the problem here is, suppose you have um, any size of uh, grid. So let's say you have n by n. Here it is actually 8 by 8 uh, grid. Uh, and there are actually 92 solutions uh, in this case. How do we use uh, programming to generate all solutions? Um, if you learn this uh, language, um, then this is actually the whole code. Okay. So the first line is actually very simple. You don't, you don't have to know this now because I didn't teach you at all. But there are actually three lines of the code. Uh, this percent sign sentence is just a comment. Okay. So the actual line that corresponds to the programming is one, two, three. So you can write the three lines of code to, gen uh, to solve this Enkins problem. The reason that this becomes succinct is because you don't have to say how to solve this problem. You just say, how, uh, what is the problem? So if you read the comment uh, for now, that's actually how uh, the rule uh, uh, is, uh, what, it, what is the rule specifying. So the first rule, at the, at the very first line is just the type. So there's a number that goes from one to n. Um, this, this line is saying that each column has exactly one pin which is uh, obviously one of the requirements for the n pins problem. Two pins cannot be on the same row, and two pins cannot stay on the same diagonal. So this is actually the sort of problem specification in English. And all you need to do is turn this into some logic form. And then the computer will find the solution for you. And in fact, if you run the code uh, for, and this is, uh, Klingo is the, uh, uh, the engine that we are going to use among the many other ancestor solvers. If you type this in the command line, okay, this is the file name, and this is uh, the parameter n is now eight, so it's eight by eight, three, then it will find the solutions. 
In fact, you can find all solutions if you put the zero at the end, then it will generate all 92 solutions. And timing is actually very efficient. It's just 0 0.009 to enumerate all 92 possibilities. So you will learn very powerful uh, programming method. Um, we don't have to know how to design the data structure here or the algorithm, but as long as you specify the problem correctly, then the using logic, uh, or the, uh, the engines that understand the logic, they will find the solutions. Okay, so that's the subject of the next class. Okay, so uh, let me stop here and I'll ask the TA to come here and uh, explain to you about the grading criteria for the uh, test and we'll distribute.